But I had a wonderful teacher at school. Um, I had hated doing English at O level. In fact, I failed my English literature O level and my history O level, which are the two passions of my life now. And uh, I, I, I started to do the science that I did biology, physics, and chemistry. And uh, doing those, I had to do, we all had to do, the scientists, um, compulsory English lessons. But uh, we had a wonderful teacher and he just enthused about poems and plays and novels and stories that he loved. And suddenly I, I, I got engaged with it completely and I, I found it fascinating and I started to read. Um, that was the first thing. And then very quickly actually I started to write and I showed him the things I'd been trying to write. He was very encouraging. And another teacher in the school, he showed them to this other teacher, who also gave me a lot of feedback. And I just started to write. And then I went to university to do a degree in biological sciences, specialising in ecology and, uh, and phycology and uh, plant physiology and so forth. Uh, and I, I decided while I was doing that degree that I wanted to be a writer. And initially I wrote, I, was a, I wrote poetry and I began to publish poetry in things like The New Statesman and, uh, and other literary magazines. And then I wrote, uh, did a bit of writing for television, but I didn't didn't really enjoy that process very much. Although later I wrote a lot for radio and enjoyed that very much indeed. Um, so it was only after I had published quite a lot of poetry and done, done other kinds of work that I suddenly decided, having seen some books that Golantz were publishing about places uh, written by authors who were not um, geographers or, or, or guidebook writers, but who were poets or novelists, um, I decided that I wanted to write my own book about the Isle of Purbeck. And I talked to my agent about it and she said, um, well, write three chapters and a synopsis. So I wrote some sample chapters and a synopsis and took them in on a Monday afternoon to my agent and uh, I was living in London then. And uh, she sent them off to Victor Golantz or to Livia Golantz, who was then the director of the company, and uh, I got a phone call on Thursday saying they bought the book, and it's never been as easy since. I was born and brought up in Poole, and one of the things I most loved when I was a kid was take, going over on the ferry, and just with a bike and stuff, and just exploring um, Purbeck, and I learnt so much of what I have subsequently sort of boned up on as well, but I mean I learnt in my bones, in my body, you know, I learned, I, I, I learned about um, geology and, I mean, Purbeck's an amazing place because it's got this incredibly compressed geology, so you move through time zones to geological uh, periods very fast as you just walk across the island. And uh, that, that sort of fascinated me, and all sorts of stories about Purbeck fascinated me, and I just loved the, the, the experience and the physicality of it, really. So that's why I was passionate about the place. I had an uncle also who lived in Sandbank who had a little boat with a driven by an old um, car motor, Austin, an old Austin something or other motor which he'd mounted in a boat. Um, and we used to we used to poodle around Pool Harbour and land on sort of forbidden islands and pick blackberries and things. And and uh, you know, so I, I was it was all part of my childhood that. So when I was living in London. And, and continuing to write and wanting to be a writer, um, the idea of the first prose book I wanted to do was, 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 it was sort of inevitable that it would be a book about that, that place. Do you think in some ways for writers it's easier to write about a place when they're not living there anymore? Yeah. I think, um, I say in uh, actually an introduction to a subsequent edition of Purbeck that, um, I mean, distance lends enchantment, um, and that's great as long as it doesn't 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 falsify as well. I think you know it's very important to, to to tell the truth about a place or the truth as you see it or the truth of your experience. But um, distance definitely lends that kind of perspective, and in in the case of certainly for me at Purbeck, enchantment to the view. So yeah, it was definitely written from a, a kind of long view but with a lot of very very close up and hands-on research and 
you know, walking and poking around and talking to people. Yeah. Uh, Livio Galantz um, asked me what I wanted to do next, and I wanted to write a book about the art of white, which I didn't know in any way um, intimately until I decided to, to, to write the book. I mean, I knew enough about it to, knew it was, to know it was attractive to, to write about. And of course, there are lots of connections with the structure of the Isle of Wight to the structure of Purbeck and all that. So it was sort of a, a move eastwards. Um, you know, in, in, the, you've got the old Harry Rocks at the end of Purbeck, sort of stepping out into the, into the sea. And then you've got, the, you've got all the vanished chalk and then the needles step up into the Isle of Wight. And it, it was sort of always a child uh, I lived in a house where I could see Purbeck and I could also see at the Far East the, the Needles and the other White. So it kind of was still part of my childhood view. And um, so I went and researched that. And of course there are lots of stories to tell about. The, in a sense there seems to be a lot more history and a lot more, silly thing to say, but a lot more literary connections and so on on, on, on White than there are on Purbeck. So there's even more biographical material in that book. Um, so I developed my writing in a different way. It wasn't nearly, it wasn't quite so personal, but it uh, expanded the, you know, my, the, the way I found I could write about places. Uh, I have family connections, um, and 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 therefore an interest in um, places in Africa and in in, in India. Uh, now I, I I see no point at all in just going to play. I see no point at all in just travelling actually. I think people travel very promiscuously. They sort of zip from one place to another, uh, have a little relationship with that place and a little relationship, and there's not much sense to it. Um, but I do think that uh, travelling for, for real sort of purposes and because of curio sort of deep-rooted curiosity is one of the most wonderful things you can do. And then Livia Galantz asked me what I wanted to do, ne to do next and was rather astounded when I said I wanted to do a book about the Congo River and a travel in, in Central Africa and uh, I had this passion to do that for various reasons because family had been involved with um, that part of Africa. Um, I had a great uncle, not a blood relation, but a great uncle who had went out to um, the Congo in 1889 and lived there apart for a couple of years when he was back in Europe and did a quick trip to America because he'd written a book about the place. Um, he uh, he died there um, in 1926, so he spent almost his entire life, from the age of 19 till his death, in in uh, in the Congo. And um, I had been fascinated too by Joseph Conrad's book *Heart of Darkness*, and also by a character called Roger Casement, who was an Irish nationalist who was the uh, British consul in Angola and Congo, and then later went out to South America and in both. Africa and South America exposed the rubber trade, which was devastating for the local people because it exploited them horrendously. But it also they also used to chop people's arms and feet off and other parts if they hadn't collected enough rubber. That's so sort of to encourage the others. Not just a horrendous trade, um, and he he campaigned about that. He also he became notorious because he was a homosexual who. Uh, at that time, which is you know a tricky thing to be, and there were black diaries, the so-called black diaries of Roger Casement, which described his time and his also his private um, relationships in in code in his diaries in, in in the Congo and in South America and so on. So he he was an interesting character for various um, various reasons, and he and Conrad had met together. So to put it simply, I was following up my own immediate families. Um, experiences in Congo in, 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 the, in the second half of the 20th century, as it were. And then I was also looking at uh, Conrad and Casement and my great-uncle Dan Crawford's experience um, a century before I went. So it was a, yeah, that kind of journey in, in their footsteps too. I thought that I would just show one or two examples of different kinds of magic. Because I'm interested in, I've sort of got a, you know, a bit of an academic interest in magic too, and I thought I'd show you um, the way in which magic can can happen. I'll show you. I'll show you something with slow of hand. Here's a little little ball and a uh, polystyrene cup. Okay. 
cup, the ball can go in the cup, and if it goes in the cup, it is invisible. Well, to you it is. It's invisible, it's disappeared. Obviously, if it comes out, I can take it and I can, in my hand, and I can put it into my pocket. Okay, put it in my pocket. Now, obviously, if it's in my pocket, it's also invisible. So the thing is this, it can be in the cup, it's invisible. It can be in my hand and be invisible, and it can go straight into my pocket, and it's still invisible. Thing is, I can, if I'm lucky, it goes back into my hand like that. Okay. So I can put the ball in the cup like that. Take it in the hand, put it in the pocket. There it goes. And there it is. Go. That's better. Yeah, and it, it travels back. Okay, now if I put it into the cup like that, you can see that it disappears, if you see what I mean. You can see that it disappears. If I took it like this, you can see that it's going into my pocket. And you, you know, there's no mistaking it, it's going in my pocket. But I can do it like this. I can put it into my hand like that, so it's invisible, and put it in my pocket so it's also invisible, okay? Now, the thing is this. I can usually make it, actually, I can't make it go into, <laughs> into the cup now. I'll explain why. It's still, um, it's still in my pocket. The reason it's still here is because there's no room for it there. That's the reason. Look at that. See what I mean? And um, <laughs> well, as well. once you've got those out of the way, of course, then you can, and it goes back into the cup like that. So that's, so that's a little bit of sleight of hand, all right? <laughs> um,